America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who have roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on A Criminal History, a Grand Theft Autobiography. Good evening. I'm your new host, the Criminal Historian. Welcome back to the show. Tonight, we bring you a very special episode on a man who has ruled the nightclub scene coast to coast. From the moonlit, garbage-strewn alleys of Liberty City to the sun-baked hipster dystopia of Los Santos, we will follow a man from humble origins long before America, or the world, began to accept those who didn't quite fit into their cookie-cutter molds, all the way to openly proud success as one of the most successful club owners the most powerful nation has ever seen. We will witness addictions, father-son dynamics, and one of the most complicated diamond exchanges you've ever heard of, as we follow the life and times of Tony Prince, better known to most of America since at least 1985 as Gay Tony. Tony Prince was born in 1958, somewhere in the Midwest. It isn't exactly clear where or when, because according to him, he spent the majority of his youth in Dukes, Liberty City. Whether or not he was actually born there is unknown, though it seems unlikely. His relationship with his parents is also unclear, so it's possible that he moved there with his family but it's also entirely possible that he made this move independently when he was still a teenager or young man, as the years are all rather ambiguous whenever the club owner is personally interrogated about this period of his life. Tony attended college at the early age of 17, perhaps having graduated high school early, but where he did his studies specifically is unknown. It's possible he attended Vespucci University in Varsity Heights, given his stories of reportedly spending much of his youth in Dukes, staring out across the Humboldt River, and dreaming of living on the other side of it in Algonquin. In fact, it may have been his initial way into Algonquin nightlife, since college boy or not, he most certainly did not focus on his education. According to Tony, one of his earliest memories of Algonquin was when he got a job working in the cloakroom as a coat checker in the late 1970s. By the early to mid-1980s, he had managed to land a gig working the front door at a club called Elephant, though likely simply checking clientele and not strictly working security, seeing as he was never a very large or physically intimidating presence. Eventually, though, Elephant shut down due to a fire, and Tony was left presumably aimless and a bit depressed at the loss of one of his primary social outlets. But all of that would change when he scrounged together enough funds and connects through his time working at other clubs to open his own club, Puddle, when he purchased and converted a former mortuary into a rave venue. It isn't entirely clear what clientele Puddle served, though it seems more than likely that it was primarily aimed at straight men and women, as by 1985, at the age of 27, Tony had started openly identifying as a gay man himself, and had even earned his most infamous of nicknames, Gay Tony, likely given to him by his primarily straight customers who frequented his club and couldn't help but notice his demeanor at a time when America was still very new to queer acceptance. That same year though, in 1985, 
He would also be arrested for tax evasion, and Puddle would be shut down while Tony spent three months behind bars, probably at the Alderney State Correctional Facility. But it was going to take a lot more than a petty tax bid and one club shutdown to stop Tony. In fact, he was only just getting started. Just one year after Puddle's shutdown, in 1986, Tony would open up his first club, aimed directly at primarily gay men, called Thunder, but shortly thereafter rename it to Two-Backed Beast. By this point, Tony was famous in Liberty City, or infamous depending on who you asked, and held enough sway to continue opening clubs throughout the 1980s and 90s, including Peacock, Platonic Fury, and Cox, all before 1996. Sometime in the late 1980s or early 90s, though, Tony would develop a rather crippling addiction to a certain white powdery substance that was sweeping the nation. By 96, he would be arrested for possession, and eventually, for reasons which remain unclear, Two-Backed Beast would be shut down by the city. Without missing a beat, though, Tony would found and open a new gay club, Hercules, as its successor on Galveston Avenue in 1998 to bring back the customers he had already earned a loyal following from through his previous ventures. He would also, at some point, likely in the mid to late 90s, open a club called Death by Machines, which was meant to serve as the straight counterpart to Hercules, further cementing his title as the king of LC nightlife, regardless of orientation. In 1999, though, Tony would be arrested again for public lewdness in an incident which remains obscure in all public records. To make matters worse, sometime between 98 and 2003, Death by Machines would burn down, much like Elephant had a decade prior. No details surrounding the fire have ever been disclosed, though, so it remains unclear if it was an accident, arson, or something else entirely. Following this, Tony was very briefly banned from opening any new venues in the city, likely due to concerns regarding his club's policies on various things such as drugs, as well as perhaps casual homophobia. By 2003, though, the ban would be lifted, and Tony would be allowed to open a new club, which would go on to become his most famous and arguably successful venture, at least in terms of notoriety, Masonette 9, just down the street from Hercules on Galveston Avenue. Masonette was likely an attempt to reclaim the audience he lost when Death by Machines burned down, as it catered to primarily, though not exclusively, straight men and women and had a very strict door policy, turning down anybody whose style was judged as inadequate, including the likes of famous mob daughters like Gracie Ancelotti. Gracie, though, would end up becoming close personal friends with Tony, and thus be allowed into his clubs, but her connections would eventually spell disaster for him, as his ability to control his drug addictions continued to be less than ideal. He would develop a bad habit of buying drugs from people connected to men like Gracie's father, head of the Ancelotti crime family, and increasingly bring attention to himself and his business ventures in the worst possible ways. He would borrow money, overpromise, and date men who often took advantage of his outward appearance of being rather wealthy, when in reality he was only ever doing okay and simply getting money from people and organizations that were less than keen on simply forgiving Tony's debts, cash or otherwise, regardless of his reputation or fame. One such man he would date would be male model Evan Moss, whom Tony would start seeing and showering with gifts and attention after breaking up with a yoga instructor he'd been seeing long term. By this point in his life, now in his late 30s, Tony was not unaware but seemed ambivalent to the way in which Evan took advantage of him, pushing him further and further into debt. He, Evan, and Gracie would all become rather close friends and spend many nights doing drugs and associating with some of the more dangerous people in the Liberty City underworld. 
In 2005, though, he would make one of the smartest business decisions of his career, even if he didn't realize it at the time, when hiring a new doorman for Hercules, Luis Fernando Lopez. Tony would later admit to Luis that he had only hired him because he thought he was dumb. But fairly quickly, the two would develop a strong father-son-like bond, since Luis had been abandoned by his father, and Tony, now in his early 40s, was coming to the realization that he would likely never have kids, if he even considered it in the first place. However, pseudo-son or not, Tony would continue to spend considerable time with people like Gracie Ancelotti, Evan Moss, and eventually world-famous heiress Chloe Parker, who would be yet another bad influence on him. His addictions would grow to include painkillers, as well as cocaine, and by 2008, he had been in and out of rehab facilities at least five separate times because of this. The vices which haunted Tony wouldn't do him any favors, as by 2008, he would be up to his eyeballs in debt to several different people, including, most prominently, the Ancelotti crime family, and a loan shark based out of Boabo, Maury Kibbutz. Tony would even begin looking for an opportunity to sell the clubs and retire, as long as he got to keep his head, which was looking increasingly unlikely, given how he so often carried himself. They must really, really want to substitute my inadequacies with their money because after all, they want to stay up all night talking bullshit to morons because they enjoy it. it sounds pretty usual. Oh, thanks for the support. Hey, that's what I'm here for, boss. And so the cycle continued. Drugs, parties, self-loathing, and cleanup. Usually with a great deal of help from Louise. On some level, being an aged Liberty City queen, Tony would know that his antics would eventually cause him more problems than he would be able to handle. However, this knowledge, however deeply it remained buried, would not prevent him from eventually opting to sell his nightclubs, or at least committing to doing so at an unspecified point in the not-too-distant future to two separate parties, those being the aforementioned loan shark Mori Kibbutz and the Ancelotti's. He wouldn't actually sign over any paperwork just yet, though, instead continuing to borrow money from both parties and simply promising by word of mouth to eventually make the sale official. In the meantime, therefore, the job of keeping them satisfied that their investment was worth their while fell primarily to Louise, who, by this point, Tony had named his unofficial business partner. Gay okay, Tony? Will always be the king of this town. You are this town. I sold a business to two different people, and they each think they own the lot. Man, we're fucked. So I'll go tell them they gave you the money as a present. If they don't like it, I take them to the special VIP room at the bottom of the West River. <laughs> it's going to be very crowded in the VIP room. These are not nice people, and there's a lot of them. And right now, you and me have to go play nice with one of them so they don't start sending rent a Goomba into the club. Fuck. It's going to be OK, man. Yeah, whatever. He likely did this in part to give himself even more of an excuse to slack in his duties as a club manager, but also because he'd developed a genuine trust in Louise as the son he never had. There wasn't a girl, man. There's always a girl. At one point, Tony and Louise would even find themselves in a dangerous firefight in Chinatown, when Rocco Pelosi of the Ancelotti crime family demanded that the two find a way to resolve a liquor license problem something that neither were actually prepared to help with. You must be the famous Tony Prince. Ah, uh, notorious, maybe. However, in Tony's mind, even after agreeing to eventually sell his club to an organization as dangerous and notorious as the Ancelotti's, if he was only able to get his hands on enough money to pay off the original debts to both them and to Maury, he would be free. In reality, this was likely never going to be the case. Maury could perhaps be made to back off with enough work, but the Ancelotti's were one of the five Liberty City crime families. You did not mess with them and get away with it. And as soon as Tony even entertained the idea with their associate Rocco, he'd already sealed his fate. But Tony didn't know this, or knew it on some level and chose to instead ignore it. Ignore it and instead pursue a harebrained scheme to get his hands on a hefty chunk of change for paying off that original drug money debt. How, you ask? 
Why that's simple, by borrowing even more money from the Ancelotti's in order to buy diamonds, which could then be cut and sold again for profit. Then Tony would simply take his supposed cut and give it all to the Ancelotti's, and then walk away a free and happy man. In theory, anyways. Oh, no, no, not again, not again, no, 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 oh, hold oh. on, guys, I want to come too. Fuck off, Evan, this is work, it's not working out. Whatever, bitch. Ah. Come on. A huge thank you to all of my wonderful YouTube members and my patrons on Patreon.com. And an extra special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. Supporters at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is also brought to you by Mason Collin's podcast channel, We're About Everything and Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel, as well as Diecastinator's channel all about diecast cars. YouTube members and patrons will get access to a second series of episodes on the Legend of Zelda series, so if you want to see those too, right now, be sure to sign up at any tier. You can already see the first of these exclusive episodes immediately. I release all videos a little early to all supporters and give you any of the original music tracks created for a given video. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos that are produced while you're pledged, get access to a small patron-only Discord server where you can easily speak with me or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and most importantly, you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously though, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express how grateful I am to all of you. Sign up today as a YouTube member, or get slightly better prices at patreon.com forward slash the criminal historian. And now back to the video. And so, a deal was arranged. You see, dear viewer, at the time, it had only been weeks earlier that a very special cargo ship had arrived in Liberty City, carrying quite a bit of volatile cargo, such as a Serbian assassin whom we've covered in a previous episode. But more important to tonight's story, that ship was also carrying a man whom our investigations have only ever been able to identify as the chef, or sometimes, alternatively, the cook. This man served aboard the platypus for many months, and had at some point back in Europe stolen an expensive set of very rare diamonds from some powerful Russian mobsters. During his travels across the ocean, he took each diamond and carefully baked them into food items in order to smuggle them into America unnoticed. He then apparently at some point retrieved them after entering the United States, and began searching Liberty City's underworld for a potential buyer. As it happens, Tony was just that buyer. It was quite common at this point in Tony's life for his less than useful boyfriend, Evan Moss, to simply be spending time at Tony's apartment or inviting himself to spend time with Tony's friends, such as Gracie or Chloe. It was perhaps not a shock then that after having gotten considerably high, Evan insisted on accompanying Tony and Louise to the diamond sale, taking place in Broker at the docks where the platypus still sat. What was shocking was what happened next. Hey, uh, what's going on? Uh, hey, well, right, what's, uh, which one is Mr. Tony? That would be me. Are right, you got what we're looking for? You got the money? Sure, right here. Then, then I'll get the ice. Hold on. How you feel about this, bro? I think I need another fucking line, okay? If it serves me right for leaving the party with you losers. Shut up, idiot. Tony, we cool? Uh, let's just get this over with. My head is killing me. My life has been reduced to this bullshit. So no, Luis, we are a long way from cool. But for right now, let's just see what the chef has to say for himself. Yeah, that's what I think. I agree. I got it, por favor. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, all right, this is them. Mm, mm, mm. These are great. Mm, they're great. But, uh, two million. You had your head in the oven. Mr. Tony, I have what they tell you, perfect clarity, beautiful clarity, well cut, and a shitload of carrots. What do you expect? 
Tony, they're gorgeous. Mm, just like you. <laughs> hey, come on, can we do a handover, please, and get out of here? This is too much. No, ignore him. He's probably been up all night with some bimbo. Tony. <laughs> You're a chef. Well cooked. Yeah. I have a line on some kitchen supplies. How about I throw that into the equation? What's the price? Look, here's the money we agreed upon less 10%. Just give us the ice. All right, all right. Hey, Tony, can I hold them? Oh. Thank you. Oh, <coughs> thanks. <coughs> Oh, shit, Tony, we out of here. Come on, let's go. Kevin, take him to the club and don't fuck about, okay? The diamonds would be stolen by the Lost Motorcycle Club and Tony's seemingly only chance at freedom, even if it never really was a chance to begin with, seemed to vanish. In the middle of all of this going on, Tony would also have Louise help him handle yet another problem plaguing his clubs in vindictive celebrity columnist the Celebinator, who was constantly taking pot shots at the two, and, given that this was still 2008, insisting that Louise and Tony were secretly a couple, knowing that it would upset Tony's business partner just as much, and hopefully, eventually, provoke a reaction. If the man whose real name we agreed not to reveal for the sake of this program is to be believed, then what happened next is quite a story. Apparently, Tony and Louise took him on a flight above Liberty City by helicopter. It's not exactly clear why he agreed to this, given that they were already hostile towards each other at the time, but regardless, he agreed. At a suitable height above Happiness Island, Luis Lopez began threatening to throw the Celebrinator from the helicopter to his death hundreds of feet below. If that alone wasn't already insane enough for you, Louise purportedly then threw the man from the helicopter, leaped out himself, caught him mid-jump, and then parachuted both men to safety below. Quite literally, torture, by any reasonable definition of the word. But to his psychotic, um, credit, I suppose, it did work. Technically, as the celebrator never made another post about the pair ever again. Eventually, though, luck would seem to favor the pair again, when Tony learned where the diamonds were about to be sold, giving Louise enough time to set up an ambush and steal them back from the first thieves, and thus putting them potentially back in the green. Things finally seemed to be looking up, when Tony learned that one of the only other people besides Louise, whom he considered a real friend, Gracie Ancelotti, had been kidnapped by a group of Irish mobsters, aided by a familiar Serbian mercenary. What were they demanding in exchange for her safe return? Why the diamonds, of course. And so a new deal was made, and Tony traveled with Louise to the Charge Island Sewage Works, where the agreed-upon exchange would take place. Ancelotti would get back his daughter, and the thieves would get the diamonds. Only, well, there was one more twist. Come back to me, honey. Let her go. Shortly after returning Gracie to her family, Louise would be ambushed by men working for the original owner of the diamonds from back in Europe, who just so happened to be in America now, Ray Bulgarin. Ray, as it turns out, had been another party who frequented Tony's clubs and was considered a potential buyer, as if Tony hadn't already agreed to sell the clubs to enough people. Louise had begun working for the dangerous Russian mobster on the side, and eventually, 
Bulgarin learned of Louise and thus Tony's involvement in the diamonds originally being purchased, and thus lost all interest in ever helping the pair again. Now all Ray wanted was Louise and Tony's heads, quite literally. To make matters even worse for Tony, despite getting his daughter back safe and sound, the head of the Ancelotti crime family was by this point less than enthusiastic about his business relationship with Tony. And more so, he was just upset at the absolute disaster the diamond situation had become, and eventually, he demanded that somebody pay the price, and that the real asset of value here, Tony's ownership of the clubs, be obtained by whatever means necessary. And so Rocco Pelosi was given a choice of who to work with, either Louise or Tony, and execute the other. Rocco, favoring Louise, then approached Tony's seemingly loyal business partner with the dangerous proposition. It's you or Tony. One of you has to die. Oh! There he is. Thank God you got here, Louise. These, these fucking guys. I talk to them. Tell them we can figure it out. It ain't that simple, Tony. Sure it is. We got money coming. We can expand, refurb, rebrand. I'm an earner. I'm a survivor. I've been in this game since 1987. Ouch. The terrible irony. You better tell him. Tony, man. What? Things are kind of fucked, man. These guys, man. These fucking guys. You never should have brought them in, man. Now somebody's got it. You know. The mix is with us now. You gotta be fucking kidding me! Times change, Tony. Your brand of charming homosexuality, it's kinda run out of steam. Someone has to pay for what's gone down. Do it! I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. After all we've been through, Lou! I'm sorry, T. You... You was family, man. But it's either you, or all of us. The Russians are coming, man! We don't got time for this gay shit! Fucking pop him already! You fucking moron! Hey, I had second thoughts, man. You fucking killed yourself just then! The Russians... Fucking everyone, they're coming after you. The old man, you're fucking dead. The both of you, they're coming any second and they're expecting corpses. We better not disappoint then. Ah, keep your head, Lou. He's a made guy. Fuck him. All right, get out of here, Rocco. What? This is for the old man and that's it. You're a dead man, Taco. Get out of my club, you fucking mook. You sure that was smart? You sure not shoot me was smart? I don't think so. Ah, all right, if we can operate, we need some, some goodwill here. What now? I don't know. Didn't he say the Russians are coming? Doesn't stop, does it? Either dead by the hands of Bulgarin's men or Ancelotti's men didn't matter. Dead was dead, and dead was exactly what Louise was going to be if he didn't make a choice. As it turned out, though, much to the shock of Rocco and even Tony, Louise decided to go for the third unnamed option of killing absolutely everybody who threatened them using overwhelming force. We aren't entirely sure what forces seem to almost protect some of the people we've documented on this series because what happened next is so unlikely that it seems almost impossible to have just been random dumb luck. Louise and Tony then somehow survived an intense and relentless ambush by dozens upon dozens of heavily armed mobsters, both Russian and Italian. We can only assume that any assumptions made about the combat skills of a man like Luis Lopez were drastically underreported because, according to many eyewitness reports and our own investigations, his body count is absolutely absurd, even beyond this seemingly unsurvivable scenario. After leaving the club, Louise would ask Tony to hide himself somewhere while he prepared to take on all of their remaining enemies at once. In reality, we actually aren't sure what happened with the Ancelotti family. After the attack at the nightclub, they seemingly gave up looking for Tony or Louise at all. Rocco Pelosi ended up fleeing Liberty City entirely due to shame from the diamond fiasco, 
and it was perhaps then in the Ancelotti family's best interests to pretend like the whole affair with Tony and Louise simply never happened. There was, however, still the matter of Ray Bulgarin's men. Tony, it turns out, would hide in the last place anybody in Liberty would be looking for him in 2008, his childhood borough of Dukes. Specifically, by the monoglobe in Meadows Park. He wouldn't be there himself to witness it, but not far away, while he waited, his daring business partner would perform some more absurdly impressive action movie feats, like leaping from a motorcycle going full speed onto a jet taking off, killing Ray Bulgarin personally, and then leaping from the wreckage of the plane destroyed by Bulgarin's grenade. He would parachute down into the park and casually saunter over to Tony, because for Louise it was just another day in the life. <laughs> I used to play around here when I was a kid, dreaming of the world, wondering what it was like at that place over there or that little island over there. You ever go that thing? Nah, went to Algonquin instead, waiting for the world to come to me. You did it, man. You did it. You, you saved my life. You, you saved the business. You, you fucking did it. Hey, man, I did what I could, bro. I'm proud of you, man. Thank you. But I don't want you to get a big head. I don't want you to go uh, change, become a megastar, go to Vinewood, write a blog. Oh, <laughs> You're a pill-popping old queen, man. I'm a murdering maniac. But we survived, bro. We survived. We did more than survive, amigo. We prospered. We took on this town and we won. We took on this place and we gave it the fucking finger. Fuck you all! I don't care what people say. Tony Prince and Luis Lopez could not be stopped. Huh? The men would also be joined by another man who had been a prospective buyer of Tony's clubs, the incredibly wealthy Yusef Amir, whom Louise had also done a great deal of work for. Now, what happens next isn't exactly clear, and we're told we cannot report on the details as some of the claims remain tied up in court cases the world over. However, we can speculate, and we here at A Criminal History love to speculate. We suspect that Tony did indeed sell at least the franchising rights for his club Mason at Nine to Yusef Amir. We're less certain whether or not he sold the rights to Hercules, as well as whether or not he actually sold the two original locations which he owned in Liberty City. Yusef had spoken about opening up Mason at Nines across the globe, and we suspect this is exactly what happened, with Tony taking a healthy cut of the profits to continue paying for his extravagant and often illegal lifestyle. Tony, however, did not fully retire from participating in the club business himself, and it's additionally unclear what role, if any, he took in managing the Masonette brand across the world. What is abundantly clear, though, to our investigative team here at A Criminal History is that Tony would go on to establish a relationship with the former host of this program and now convicted felon Guinness Walker. When he made the decision to move coasts and re-establish himself in Los Santos, San Andreas. Tony, your friend's here. All right, thank God. Brilliant. That's a wrap. Piss off, Laszlo. What? This is a nightclub. This live version of an awful TV show is not happening. Not, not, but Tony... Oh, but Tony, please, nothing. We have a new landlord. We're going back to what we do best. Playing loud music, encouraging awful behavior, dancing until dawn, and having personal crises like good, God-fearing idiots. <laughs> Tony, please, I'm desperate. <laughs> Listen, I love narcissism. I built a career on narcissism. I stare into the mirror and beat off like a real man. I pose, I preen, but there's a limit here. I cannot, I will not sit here and watch it. We need kids, young people, midlife crisis divorcees, whoever's gonna bring the party, and we need them wasted, and we need them dancing. Not taking selfies with some fuckwits! I ran the fucking 1980s. I was the 1990s. And 
I'm back. Okay. Get me a DJ! But, Tony, I, I, I'm the DJ. <laughs> I'm the, no, you're not a fucking DJ. You're a dick. Uh, a dick? But, uh, Tony, I got you a bunch of celebs. I'm gay Tony. The gay Tony. I'm the celebrity here. Me and him. But if you want to bring some famous people into the club, we will host them gracefully. Because I am favor and grace, and I am back. I got an investor. We're running shit again. I need a DJ. <laughs> I've been high since 2010. What do these kids need nowadays? Uh, I'm having a breakdown. <sighs> I'm too old. Me too. Yeah. Tony, can we hug? Yeah, yeah. Please. Sure, yeah. You shouted at me a lot. All right, all right, all right. And Tony? Yeah. I don't think you can say gay Tony anymore. It's not PC. The internet will go crazy. Okay, I'll bear that in mind. All right, all right. Find me English Dave. English Dave? He says a DJ, the booker. He's in the book. All right, come on, boss. Let me show you around. All right, listen, big guy, work your list of famous people. We're opening very soon. Okay, you got it. All right. I am gonna fix this place up for you. You can do whatever you want down here. Literally, whatever you want. That's a gorgeous space. Plenty of room, lots of storage. You can set up a hub for your other businesses, maybe. I don't know, I'm just saying. Whatever you need, I know nothing. I mean, I know everything, but hmm. Make your way through there. You got a computer in there. You can bring another staff down here, your whole entourage, whatever you need. You sure know how to set that up. And upstairs, Upstairs is another office with a computer on the same network. You can run the club businesses out of that. And the interior team ready to move in. Oh, and the name, Omega. Mm, mm, mm. Let's go. Omega! <laughs> hey. Que pasa? Hey, hello, Dave. Hello, Dave. That's <laughs> uh, my new investor, English Dave. Ah, uh, safe. Skin. Respect. So how you been, Tone? Long time, no power. Yeah, how's it going, Dave, and cursing fate? And you? Oh, never better, old son, never better. <laughs> One love. Nice bag? Ah, oh, no, thanks. Ah, <laughs> suit yourself. <sighs> what can I do you for? We're reopening as a nightclub. <laughs> a proper, underground, dance music paradise. And what kind of crowd do you want in this, uh... Paradise. Uh, don't be judgmental, Dave. We're gonna make this place amazing. I need people, you know, who know music. Club music. What you need, old son, is a European. <clears throat> Someone with savoir faire. Someone who can bring in the business. Let me see. <clears throat> no, not him. Not her. To open this dump, bring in a good crowd. Solomon. It's the proper shit. Great music, great crowd, and no cheese. Mmm, how much? Let me see what I can do. Daniel, his manager, owes me a favor. I've got a few other DJ ideas as well. One love. One love. Well, you gotta get to work. I'll stay here and oversee the improvements. You get us a staff and a sound system. Do you know Ritual Sacrifice? Festival out in the desert. Gotta borrow some things from their socialist utopia. And staff, I've arranged to poach a few. It's all on the office computer. It's unclear exactly when Tony decided to move to LS, or exactly where he decided to live in the city itself, but what is known is that by 2018, he would make a deal with Guinness, who by that time had acquired quite a bit of power in the Los Santos criminal underworld. As part of the deal, Guinness would fund the renovation, restoration, and final construction on the club, and pay for all other expenses necessary to get the club up and running. Afterwards, Tony would help to bring in the clientele, including DJs like Tale of Us and Solomon, and carefully vetted staff members, as well as see to managing the establishment's day-to-day -day operations, as Guinness was often and usually away working on some ridiculous project for a government agency or international criminal kingpin. Come downstairs. Now remember, I do not nor want to know what's going on down there. I will plead absolute stupidity, but if you need my help, anytime, count on me. Now, this place is fully operational, huh? I don't do the tax returns, and I don't deal with whatever goes on down here. Now, I'm just a club manager, but if you happen to, say, fill it with some, uh, various products of your illicit businesses, I could probably help you sell them. All right, all right, all right, now, everything else on the computer over there, and in the office. Shall we head upstairs? Here's our private office. The computer where you'll run things, my desk is over here. 
Hear no evil, see no evil. <laughs> Good. All right, let's go get a quick drinky at the bar. Brave. Brave, mate. Think of nothing. Absolutely nothing. And brave. Ain't it amazing? Hello, Tone. Ah. Sniff. Ah, no thanks. Hey, baby, four shots. Good news. The big European is on the wing. Private, of course. Spared no expense, as you're paying. Well, it was a cheap plane, but whatever. Should we go and pick him up? And when you get back, we shall have ourselves a little party. Yeah. Here's to Omega. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll see you shortly. You all right, Laz? A little fucked up. <laughs> this is, as far as we are aware, what Tony continues to do to this day in late 2024. Manage the club, which we checked, is indeed still in operation despite Mr. Walker's arrest late last year and conviction earlier this year. Who exactly Tony is working for these days is anyone's guess, but we imagine the rest of his lifestyle has remained largely the same. But at this point, the man is approaching his 70s and likely won't be in the game much longer. Rumors say that big changes are coming to Los Santos in the next year, and perhaps that could mean either the end of the Los Santos Mason at Nine branch, or perhaps just the end of Tony's reign as active king of nightlife on the West Coast. Whatever the case, how many other people can ever claim to have conquered both the East and West? Hip Hop, Alexander the Great, and Gay Tony Prince. Tony Prince is a legend in the American nightclub scene for good reason. He broke boundaries and established new trends and helped to push for social justice, at least for openly queer men. His influence and style are still well known to this day, even as he becomes an aged old queen, and his legacy amongst club owners, straight or queer, across America and the world is nearly unparalleled. He is arguably one of the most well-known and perhaps most successful nightclub owners across the globe, though given his tendency to accumulate debt in the past, it's unknown just how well off he remains to this day, or how much longer he plans to keep at it. So evidently the man was talented, talented at running a business, building a brand, and running his mouth. But Tony Prince was also rude, temperamental, overdramatic, petty, and occasionally homicidal when things didn't go his way. He got to where he is in the industry by being ruthless, even if he's not always interested in pulling the trigger himself. He was never afraid of getting a little dirty if it meant he got what he wanted in the end, whether that be a new shiny boy toy, a new club, or more often than not, a lot of recreational drugs. Tony was also capable of being loving and being a good friend. Although not frequently in the right frame of mind or wallet to actively help his friends, he valued their safety and was always willing to be an ear to bend and offer his two cents. He was compassionate and perhaps a bit romantic, but he was also less than picky about the men he dated, and often gravitated towards those who were the worst for him. In short, beyond the homicidal stuff, Tony was very much a stereotypical homosexual man, raised in the 60s and 70s. He certainly ticked many of the boxes anyway, but he wasn't just the stereotype. In a lot of ways, he helped to establish that stereotype, being one of the more well-known people, especially as far as criminals go, to be openly out as a gay man as early as he was. But there was that homicidal stuff. He certainly did have a lot of people killed either directly in his name or by proxy and as a result of his actions, which were more often than not selfish in nature. Tony was by no stretch of the imagination a good man. As we mentioned previously, Tony was arrested multiple times. In 1985 for tax evasion, in 1996 for possession of a controlled substance, and in 1999 for public lewdness. In addition to these charges, however, we also believe that Tony Prince would be responsible, at least in part, 
for a number of criminal adjacencies, such as working with an organized crime outfit such as the Ancelotti crime family, purchasing drugs, often in absurd quantities, for his own personal consumption, accessory to murder when helping the Ancelotti's on numerous occasions, such as when Rocco Pelosi fought another family at the Liberty City driving range or the firefight in Chinatown, the attempted purchase of some illegally imported diamonds and subsequent accessory to murder for the actions of his bodyguard and business partner, Luis Lopez. Accessory to murder for Luis's work in retrieving the diamonds and the exchange of them for Gracie Ancelotti at Charge Island. Torture and kidnapping when helping Luis to terrorize the celebrinator into leaving them alone. Accessory to illegal distribution of goods, including narcotics, when knowingly allowing Guinness Walker to store and distribute illegal goods beneath the Los Santos Mason at 9. And potentially numerous other accessory charges for his knowing involvement with criminals across the country and likely around the world. We're not able to compile a full list of his charges due to the ambiguity of his involvement with many different individuals and groups, but make no mistake, my dear viewer, Mr. Prince is far from innocent. What is it about American nightlife which attracts so much violence and criminality? We here at A Criminal History can't say for certain, but we suspect it's all the drugs. And I mean, what's a good nightclub without good drugs? America knows the answer to this question, but Tony Prince is the one who answered it. So the next time you're out in the middle of a Friday night in Liberty City or Los Santos, screaming your head off and having a good time, Remember that it's because a pasty, balding white dude melting in the West Coast heat paved the way for you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of A Criminal History, and we apologize for the long absence. Our network's test markets hoped to reach audiences beyond their established ones, but focus group after focus group said that we needed to suck it up and get back to basics. So we're back, and we hope to see you again very soon. I'll see you next time, folks. I'm your host, The Criminal Historian, and I hope you have yourself a wonderful evening. Bye-bye!